I'm Brian Foster, and this is the Grindhouse Institute. On each episode of this podcast, Jeremy Floyd and I program a triple feature movie night. Each of the movies share common themes, and we discuss them here. We're happy you could join us for today's block we call Inspiring Kill Bill, Volume 1. Following the release and success of Pulp Fiction, Quentin Tarantino's stardom skyrocketed. Through his non-linear storytelling, quippy long-form dialogue, and stylized violence, audiences expected to see something new and fresh while honoring traditional Hollywood and the grindhouse films he grew up with. Kill Bill was Tarantino's ode to martial arts and exploitation films of the 70s. Coping with grief, a widow seeks revenge against the five men responsible for her husband's murder. One by one, she systematically hunts them down, scratching them off her list until none remain. Directed by Francois Truffaut and starring Jean Moreau in the title role, The Bride Wore Black from 1968. After her mother dies, the young Yuki must train her whole life to be an assassin in order to fulfill a vendetta imposed upon her at birth. Using a unique umbrella, Yuki will slice, dice, and stab her way through several foes in her pursuit to avenge her family's death. Meiko Kaji delivers a hypnotic and action-packed performance as the avenging Asura in 1973's Lady Snowblood. Awakening from a coma, a former member of the Deadly Viper assassination squad swears her revenge against the group that left her for dead. One by one, you guessed it, she will enact her vengeance on every member of the team on her journey to find the gang's ringleader, Bill. Uma Thurman stars as The Bride in Kill Bill, Volume 1. Thank you for listening to the Grindhouse Institute. Please enjoy. Coming! Sarah, I cannot believe you are early. Oh, you were recording on Pro Tool. You are way cooler than we are. Yeah, well, I mean, look at all the... You know, musical exactly. fun stuff he's got in the background over there. It's in all, fact, it's, it's he's, he's better. He, he better have that kind of equipment if he's gonna, <laughs> if he's in his studio. But well, you don't know how I, 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 the, the way I deliver my scores. Everything's recorded on an iPhone. <laughs> no microphone, even just right. Now. Oh God! Layered just on as top a of uh, God, as a uh, I don't know what Easter egg or something on on hard problem. They had me, you know, temp all these lines. They temp ADR lines and and temp um, lines that they hadn't recorded. And for some reason, one of them made it into the damn movie when I, when we saw it. I was like, wait a minute, that <laughs> they didn't replace that? Which line? <laughs> it was like the, the hotel concierge that was me. <laughs> oh, that calls up to the room? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is you. That's right. Yeah. And what's crazy is like I just recorded it on my phone while I was like <laughs> sitting here in the office. <laughs> I was like, anyway, movie so magic. there you go. The magic, magic of cinema. Yeah, right, right here. <laughs> See this this thing this that isn't real. There's just a phone right here. That's the yeah. there's no Pro Tools. It's a joke. Right, right. We we, we, we pull out the plug. We, we we get your file and you just sound like absolute shit. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, this, is just a, this is just this is just a this is a dummy mic. It's yeah, just a, it's a, a toilet paper yeah, roll. Yeah, I was gonna. Say, there's Skittles in there. You keep like <laughs> snacks in there. <laughs> right, right. You, you just wanted to look cool on camera. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, know, you gotta do what you gotta do. Yeah. Fuck you, bitch. I know he didn't qualify that shit. So you can just kiss my motherfucking ass, Black Mom. All right, welcome back to the Grindhouse Institute. I'm Brian Foster, and with me as always is Jeremy Floyd. Hello, and how are ya? Yeah, uh, I just realized that uh, that woman deserves her revenge. And we, <laughs> we deserve to die. Nice. <laughs> Yep, that's right, folks. We are going to be talking about films that inspired Kill Bill Volume 1 today. Um, I'm so excited. I've been so excited about watching this movie again. It's, it's probably been a few months since I'd last seen it. Um, a and few months. <laughs> a few months, yeah. I watch it definitely regularly. Uh, I see. And on this uh, show, we have a very special guest to talk about uh, the inspiration for Kill Bill Volume 1. Uh, Jeremy, would you like to do the intro? Yeah, um, excited to, to finally... Uh get this guest on i've had him uh in in the hopper for a while here uh but uh a composer uh fellow cinephile longtime collaborator omar fidel thank you thank you thank you for having me i'm super excited to be here welcome yeah definitely this is a very exciting show that we've got for you omar um i'm really glad that uh you, you could talk about these films with us this trio of revenge films 
um, all starring <laughs> um, a female or multiple female protagonists. Um, yet again, I have not seen two of the three films uh, that we had are talking about today. Mm. Um, I had heard about Lady Snowblood, and I knew the inspiration there. Um, not you know watching it, obviously the uh, the inspiration was clear. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit. Yeah. Um, also, The Bride Wore Black. Um, this is the first. I'm pretty sure this is the first Truffaut film we've had on the show. On the show, yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, So this was really exciting to see something or to watch something where I thought we were just going to be watching uh, martial arts films uh, that were inspirations for Kill Bill. (laughs) And this was really great to watch something that was more, you know, thematically and formatted uh, in the same way um, and very much in the same format as Kill Bill uh, with the uh, revenge, you know, one by one taking out gentlemen. Yeah. Um, so the three films that we've got today, uh, The Bride Wore Black from 1968, Lady Snowblood from 1973, and Kill Bill Volume 1 from 2003. Very exciting. Ooh, it's been a while since 2003. Dave. I had no idea it was that long ago. <laughs> I Yeah. <laughs> wow. I guess time flies when you're Quentin Tarantino. It really does. Um, yeah, I'm pretty excited to talk about these ones. Um Kill Bill, uh, along with all other Tarantino movies, basically you could grab probably a dozen films to uh, to to wrap up as the inspiration and like the places where he's borrowing things. This might be the most of them, most overt of them, though. <laughs> For sure. I mean, you know, we, we, on the Reservoir Dogs one, we, <laughs> the City on Fire it was pretty overt. Yeah, um, but this one had you know like the between the Green Hornet music playing out of nowhere, you know, like the actual theme from Lady Snowblood is the finisher or the last right. song you hear, you know, like there was right. some very in your face moments. <laughs> yeah, well, and and as we'll see in, in the next one, um, the, the the sort of theme from Ironside, you know, is the sort of opening theme of the Shaw Brothers, like the the Five Fingers of Death. <laughs> Um, you know, th- there's tons and tons of things that he's sort of uh, alluding to and ripping off from uh, in both these movies. But, you know, we're kind of looking at the first one here. Um, and it's interesting. I was I read some old um, interview that he gave right around the release of the first one. And he talked about how the Bride War Black was not an influence on him. <laughs> Despite all the similarities, that's what I read last night. Because I, I was reading, I, I had never watched the first two films either. And oh, okay. so last night I looked at that, and it said that yeah, that he he alleges that he had never watched that movie before. Or never, right. I don't know if he said he never watched or never heard of it or one or the other. Mm. And I was like, hmm. with even with the, <laughs> the Death List Five that this woman right. had, and like every single the, the exact same book, yeah, exactly. The and plane, like, you know, yeah, it's, everything was in there. I, I don't know what groom, you know, murdered at the altar. I mean. I guess it's not outside of the realm of possibility, but it seems <laughs> it, it it seems like a, a, t- a tough one to swallow. It seems slightly suspect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although, you know, the other suspect thing is that he says that he hates Truffaut. <laughs> really? He does say that? Or at least that. in that interview, he, he, he said he wasn't a huge fan. So, I you know, and, and I, I guess if you see in this one, like, Bride War Black versus Snowblood, you know, Snowblood, there's a lot of style that he takes out of that as well. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, Bride War Black, I mean, it's Truffaut sort of aping Hitchcock. Yeah. And this is, like, one of uh, a couple films that he did where he was trying to, like, recapture the Hitchcock spirit. Uh, Truffaut, that is. With with the Bernard Herrmann score following and the Th- that twist. That, too. <laughs> yeah. Which I was super interested in. I had no idea that... Neither. I mean, I yeah. guess I don't know that much about Herrmann. I mean, I know... You know the you you may have heard of him, yeah, yeah, (laughs) yeah, no, yeah, yeah. He's he's slightly unknown character, but no, I I didn't. So whenever his name came up on the in the opening titles, I was like, wait, Mm -hmm. what? Yeah, Bernard Herrmann did this, Mm -hmm. and then so like, of course, I'm on Wikipedia, and it's funny because just last week I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who's a huge film score enthusiast, and he had the um, he had just read the Bernard Herrmann biography, and I was like, oh man, I need to get that because I don't know anything about Bernard Herrmann. And then I was watching this, and I saw his name on the screen. I was like, wait, what? He did non-English language films, I guess? And right. then there's this whole – so I was, of course, on the Wikipedia, his Wikipedia entry. And then he left the U.S. at some point, and then he – I think he died in Europe, and he started doing all these European films. But then – well, he did the Scorsese film. It was the last film he did, I think. Right, right. Anyway, it's, that was a huge Tax surprise. Was that Cape Fear? 
Well, no, it was Taxi Driver. I, it, taxi Driver was the last one he wrote. Uh, but, you know, Cape Fear, he did the original music right, for. Right, he took the music, yeah. And then I think Leonard Bernstein kind of reorchestrated it. Uh, right, yeah. The last one scored to picture was um, the Scorsese. Taxi Driver, yeah. Uh, yeah, this was uh, the Bride Wore Black was was so interesting. Um, it's another one of those films. It kind of felt Polanski esque in my um, in mm-hmm. you know the way that it was mm-hmm. shot, the way yeah. that it felt. Um, but call, I mean, yeah. this was one of those films where they start you off with like a "What the hell is going on?" moment. You know, this <laughs> this woman is trying to kill herself, and you have no idea why. You don't know what's going on, and it just kind of snaps you out of that, and then you're into the story of this massive revenge plan that ultimately ends up being, you know, not like a very, I mean, it was a conspiracy because there's multiple people involved, but it wasn't that crazy of, a, of an assassination. <laughs> it wasn't like this guy was like plotted to be killed or anything like that. It was right. more of a bunch of douchebags that got drunk and killed this guy. And she was on her way whoops. to, yeah, yeah and a whoops, <laughs> it was a whoopsie. It's, um, it, it's, it's that very Hitchcockian um, yeah. device of like the, like, you know what's the old saying it's like a coincidence can get you into trouble but it can't get you out of it uh, as a writer and like in this case uh i think the coincidence getting them into it is a little weird but <laughs> well, let's just roll with that one like... <laughs> kind of a rug pull out from under you kind of thing right, right. um when 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 they when they when they said that i was a little bit on the disappointed side right it was a bunch of drunks playing poker in a room and this idiot bald guy that i don't even think has a line in the movie and is the one that ends up shooting the guy <laughs> yeah. um, he has a line it's <laughs> <at the very laughs> end. you could have used a wilhelm scream or yeah. something <laughs> <laughs> right but yeah i mean it was like i said it was, it was kind of disappointing to to see that but then you know when you think about it it's like yeah i mean like accidents can happen like this like kind of a, a very tragic story you know woman loses her her husband on their wedding day and then she goes off in such great uh, style to kill these five men that were um, all responsible for his death. And it keeps ramping it up every, every so often or, or every kill that she does. And it's just really, really excellent how they, how they set everything up. Yeah. No, that, that part was really great too. I mean, it's like, she's um, blazing a trail of revenge. Her whole life has just become this one singular thing, much as perhaps uh, the bride in Kill Bill or like the uh, what was the character's name in uh, Snowblood? Yuki. 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 As uh, Yuki's whole life was set up to be this, uh, you know, uh, intergenerational revenge. Yeah. But you know, with with, uh, with this one, it's uh, you know, she has a singular focus and like is going through tr- cross enough every name on her list and to the point where even she's. Uh, gets herself arrested on purpose to be able to get to jail to get close to this guy to get him (laughs) (laughs) yeah and they even bring that up they're like it seemed a little a little easy that she got caught she seems a little too smart to just get caught that simply yeah she was so smart and then she got caught like that how's that even possible yeah but then you know there was a whole plan behind to get the the bald uh speechless guy (laughs) the actual killer Uh yeah and a bunch of just low lifes uh that she was taken out i mean each one of these guys they seem to just get worse and worse as a male i was just like really <laughs> embarrassed for them like as another man like jesus these guys are terrible yeah and i and i love uh whatever his name is mikhail lonsdale the you know the french peter dinklage guy uh <laughs> he was like the aspiring politician who was like Death was so nuts because like, it was like, wait, wait a second. How did he die exactly? He was like, got, got suffocated to death? Is that when he got locked under the stairs? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. It, it just got a little hot in there and he, he like ran out of oxygen. Is that what happened? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was kind of worried. I was like, what's going on? They, she taped the hinges, I guess, or like around it yeah. and then he suffocated? How does that right. work? Is that possible? I, I was sitting there going through the, the physics of well, it. Well, yeah, it, everything else was completely airtight in there, apparently. So. Right. <laughs> yeah, I was like, man, they've got amazing construction in France. <laughs> great tape. <laughs> Ran out of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, they don't build tape. them like they used to. But, I mean, th- but there were some really interesting ones. Uh, the syringe of poison in the bottle of booze that she shared with um, Mr. Corral was his name. Um, where he right. basically turned into Michael Madsen getting bit by the Black Mamba, slowly dying in the middle of the floor. <laughs> right. And I know that's Kill Bill too, but still, there was a, a you know similarity there. Um, but a spoiler, yeah. 
<laughs> That's next episode. Sorry about that, guys. Um, but another one of these like sh- uh, movies that have a, an excellent oneer that that you know kind of you disappear within that oneer. And again, there's one in Kill Bill Volume One that kind of reminded me a lot of it inside of the mm. the treehouse uh, ending restaurant, whatever the that blue was. flower or whatever it's called, blue yeah. leaf, yeah, blue leaf cafe or whatever it's called. Yeah, exactly. Where the uh, that awesome band is playing. What um, was the winner in this one? I'm remind me. Uh, it's it's by it's toward the end. It's when she meets that Moraine um, guy, uh, where she gives the telegram. It's it's like the full long thing. So she's got to get the wife out of the house. So she sends oh. the telegram yeah. of the wife being sick. So she leaves, and then there's like this whole casing sequence of her casing like the apartment, case going in and oh, out. Right. And it's okay, just okay, a okay. really long, yeah, beautiful yeah. take. Yeah. I- only watched it three days ago. And I already <laughs> All the movies the run together now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the problem. <laughs> no, but it, it was fascinating, like, you know, having that, I don't know what, the, the second generation Hitchcock uh, or, or the, the Hitchcock impression being executed in, in France this way. I mean, and you, you see it in so many different ways, uh, just on, in terms of the Hitchcock influence real quick. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, at the very beginning, I mean, obviously there's the Bernard Tumorn score, which, you know, for that bulk of Hitchcock's career, they had that close association. Um, but then when she is, uh, I guess, lying to her family that she's going to go on a train trip, as she's getting to that, that train station, it, the shots are very, very similar to uh, shots in Marnie, uh, where she's got kind of the, the bag with her and everything. And obviously, like, the uh, <laughs> the uh, sort of, I don't know, uncanny coincidences, let's say, that uh, <laughs> sort of uh, drive the plot along. Uh, also so, sort of very Hitchcock. Like, it, it only, like, sort of works in the movies, but, you know, yeah. sort of makes for, for a more thrilling tale type of thing. I mean, I think that that goes with her getting arrested, right? I mean, she probably yeah, wouldn't exactly. have full access <laughs> to everybody else in the prison if she went and went to just went to jail. So, yeah. Right. Also, that they have a, a co-ed prison system there, huh? <laughs> right. <laughs> Apparently, yeah, that was kind of threw me off as well. I was like, "What's going on there?" <laughs> you never know. But this was this was a great great movie full of like those, these shocking moments of you know when um, the first guy Bliss when she pushes him off the balcony um, and they show him his legs hitting the ground <laughs> like it's, like I had to <laughs> take a breath. Right. I was like, "That was a really nasty fall." Um, there's this plane shot with her looking at her list of people to kill, and it's like. The kill list, yeah. If Kill Bill didn't, or if Tarantino didn't steal that for Kill Bill, then he accidentally <laughs> saw that, like on, you know, yeah. like at some point, like he might not have seen the yeah, whole that's movie. That's the part where it's like, I don't know if I believe that. You <laughs> right. Know? It's like, yeah, I never, I've never heard of that movie. Or I never saw that movie, and you're like, I don't know. It was the same very shot. Coincidental. <laughs> that was like when uh, James Cameron, like, famously claimed that he never saw The Outer Limits. That uh, you know that Harlan Ellison wrote where it was like with the Terminator and I... you know he was like no no I just had a fever dream while I was uh, <laughs> in Italy r- working on this other movie and you're like yeah okay buddy fever dream right right <laughs> the, this is uh, Tarantino's fever dream apparently yeah <laughs> I mean especially she's crossing off the goddamn names on the list on that plane it was almost the same shot it was <laughs> the same shot I, pr- I I bet if we we did one of those side by sides on something right, it would look right, exactly right. the same no exactly I mean has has he ever gone back and said that you know recanted his previous statement that he never saw the film i mean or is that still hold true i don't know i and and that article where he said that it was it was some sort of online publication which has since been taken down uh and it was you know <laughs> the the interview is still up on the sort of like uh what's it called the internet archive type of thing the Wayback machine yeah. but uh i don't know i mean um that it was just it was a funny thing to read and it's like you know, well, why is he bothering to deny these things at this point? You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, it doesn't make sense. I mean, I can see him denying it, you know, in 2003 or whatever. Right. But now, I mean, it just seems, what's the point? You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the rest of your movie is taking intros from Shaw movies, you know, scores from different movies, uh, images, and you're, you're loading it all in there. Like, this is the one. Yeah, the, you, know? well, you didn't harvest something from another film. I mean, I don't know. It doesn't make sense to me. No big deal, man. It's it's all good. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, <laughs> harvest. I, I like that. Yeah, that's, that's, good. that's a good one. It's a polite way of saying, uh, you know, pinch. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. No, exactly. I thought the bride um, in, in this one, or Julie, I believe her name was correct. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, I think it's interesting that she was not trained like the other women in these other films, you know, to be a killer. Um, she just kind of had this like instinct in her and she seemed to just be very smart. 
as opposed to like Lady Snowblood, where Yuki was literally born into a vendetta. <laughs> and then, right. you know, the and, bride. You know, trained since age 11 or whatever that was. Right. Yeah, in, in, yeah exactly. From Pai Mei, possibly. Not Pai yeah. Mei, you know? <laughs> From not, don't call him Pai Mei. From yeah. not Pai Mei. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, she, she just kind of, she just had these skills, this this murderous, I don't know, skill to just take out men after one after yeah. another without any you know formal training. <laughs> I mean, is there is there there's a gap in the plot there? Do they mention like what the time is between when her husband is shot and whenever she kind of goes on this exodus or whatever it is? I thought it was only like a year. So we're to believe that within that year she <laughs> somehow became this vicious killer. A ruthless killer. Or uh, well, I, I guess that's the other thing. Is like we don't really know anything about her. Maybe she was a vicious killer before all this. Yeah, know. right. It's possible. That's yeah. interesting. I mean, <laughs> that would be cool to explore outside of the frame on that one. <laughs> she was the bride in Kill Bill, except she, you know, wasn't. They didn't try to kill her, and then she, I don't know, she took her skill set and applied it. I don't know. Right. Exactly. <laughs> totally go deep into this. Right. I mean, you know, it, I guess that's that's. Some of the stuff with like the character of the sort of the Julie, the, the bride character in this one, like, I mean, it's like the sort of lack of character and the lack of understanding in there, I think is some of the weaknesses of the movie. Yeah. That and sort of like sort of the, the pacing toward the end, like uh, especially like around the time of the when she was uh, hunting the uh, the painter or whatever, the, the artist, mm-hmm. um, right. we're starting to, to drag our feet pacing wise on that one. Although I have to say I uh, really enjoyed that guy's bath mat. Uh, if you remember, that. I don't remember. <laughs> it was like just a, it was a bunch of molds of breasts on the. On the oh ground. yeah, and she stepped <laughs> on it. Right? Oh, it's that like, thing was amazing. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. he brought it up. Right? Like he mentioned it. Like <laughs> yeah. oh, I had that made. <laughs> All right, weirdo. Yeah, that thing was incredible. <laughs> you mean that's custom? <laughs> yeah, I was like, where can I buy that? Is there? <laughs> like I would just lie to her and be like, "That's the only one they had. <laughs> Needed a bath mat." <laughs> <laughs> they had one with a bunch of dicks on it, but you know, it wasn't as comfortable on my feet. It was sold out. I don't know. I was going to get that one. <laughs> you should be tripping over it all the time. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, that's the world's most epic bath mat. Yeah. <laughs> What's funny is that, um, so, I mean, Truffaut didn't like that film at all, it sounds like, or what I gathered from a couple things I read. The Bride War Black. Uh, Bride War Black. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I um, actually didn't look any of that stuff up. I probably should have, but I mean, was it a was that a was it a success like a commercial success? Or like I don't I don't know that much about it. Like within the context of actually when it came out and the era that it came out, rather. Yeah, uh, apparently it it was. Uh, I mean, at least box office wise, uh, it did nine it, million dollars on a less than million dollar budget according to IMDb. Oh wow. Or Wikipedia, sorry, but yeah, I mean. Definite success. Well, so so it was a commercial success. He just didn't like it, is what I read. Roger Ebert seemed to like it. Three and a half <laughs> out of four stars there, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Oh. But I mean, you know, in terms of like what the... Um, when someone thinks of a Truffaut film, you know, they're thinking of like the Jules and Jim and uh, 400 Blows and all this. And that appeals to a different crowd than perhaps the uh, revenge Hitchcock thriller movie that this one was Mm -hmm. so you know you you could see how people (laughs) maybe at the time weren't as excited about it yeah i think this one fell right into in in line with a hitchcock though it it felt like it could have been a hitchcock film in many ways sure Um, you know i I wouldn't say it's being copied or anything it definitely was inspired by some hitchcock stuff but i mean you're right And, and especially at that time like that era of hitchcock where he in between maybe um i don't know the birds and frenzy uh he's uh He's not at, at the top of his game, mm. Hitchcock, that is. And that would have fallen right at uh, around this time, 1968. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, it certainly feels like it's of that world or of that era. Not necessarily yeah. an homage, but, you know, there's some sort of influence in there. Definitely. At least, I mean, I felt that from, I mean, I felt that from the score, too, definitely. So oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I felt like it was going down there. No, what about Lady Snowblood? Like how how I don't like I don't know how was that movie received? Because that's is that's earlier, right? Isn't that an earlier? No, that one came later? after. That was a seventies film. That was like seventy two. Oh, seventy three is what I have. Um, yeah, but I, I know that that movie is very well regarded. I mean, 
it definitely is now. I, yeah. I mean, I wonder at the time. I mean, it did have a sequel. Uh, it it was based off of a, a manga that the you know a, a manga series I should say, and apparently that thing was was pretty popular, and it was supposedly one of the first mangas where they'd have sort of a heroine lead, the, the you know sort of female character kicking ass. You know, the the author of that series, uh, I'm forgetting his name right now. Um, he was talking about how. Uh, like like now we have, we don't bat an eye at having uh, the female badass that slices heads off and <laughs> yeah right. and and or all bodies this stuff. completely in half right our bodies in half. Uh, but um you know at the at the time it was uh, kind of groundbreaking I can see that um, in, in Japan anyway I don't know yeah I mean while you've got the the bride and the bride wore black as kind of a Golgo thirteen no no personality kind of uh character yeah she, yeah yeah she really didn't say much um, and like gogo we don't know fucking anything about her <laughs> exactly yeah I, I did feel a lot of golgo in there um and then when we were watching uh kill bill i felt a lot of golgo in there as well mostly from the anime that um what one production uh did in the middle of it mm-hmm. um you know that the same guys that did uh ghost in the shell or the new ghost in the shell that that anime right. uh, in oh, mix okay. there that shot of that one Obviously, it's a military official in the back with the two girls laughing. Ha, ha, ha. And then he gets shot and they oh, see yeah. right through his head. Like, that was totally like Golgo 13. Like, I was right, like, right, okay, right, right. Perfect. No, um, exactly. But talking about Lady Snowblood, this movie um, is exactly what I would think that Kill Bill 3 would be about. Um, in fact, it would be called <laughs> Kill Bell. And it would be, you know, Vernita Green's daughter going after was, yeah. the bride. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that this that's kind of exactly what this movie was. I think it's almost like, there's a sequel within the movie <laughs> kind of i mean I, although they they did it even within this movie like um i don't remember the character's name but like the daughter of the you know drunken gambler yes who uh you know stabs yuki at the end there's the revenge yeah it was pretty much the <laughs> yeah the uh you know green's daughter so i mean let's go through this real quick so there yeah. is a protagonist um a, a lady snowblood who then starts her revenge path, almost finishes it, gets caught in the middle of it, is sent to a Tokyo prison, Mm -hmm. has sex with several men in the hopes of having a a son or someone to take (laughs) on this vendetta, right? Right. And finally she does. And it was like, all this was planned. It was another one of those, well, the circumstances probably will work in a movie, but it's kind of wild <laughs> to like plan that far ahead. <laughs> but, yeah. but very poetic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to sus- really got to suspend the hell out of your disbelief. Yeah, absolutely. Well, all, it, yes, it, but yeah. <laughs> it's all fa- fantasy and I get that. Um, and it's quite poetic in many ways, um, but quite a layered story this was. And I was, I, I, I almost was taken back by how layered it actually was or how layered it ended up being. It could have mm-hmm. been just a straight up revenge, you know, one after another, sure. a new kill here and there. But man, it's not, you know, it's much more than that. No, it, was, it seemed it seemed a lot smarter than it could have been. It could have been just kind Certainly. of, you know, pretty simple and, you know, just mm-hmm. revenge, tech, 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 kill, kill, kill. But it seemed like it was a bit more cerebral, so which was kind of nice. Absolutely. I, mean, I, was, I was pleasantly surprised. Yeah, and it was interesting seeing the uh i guess the influence on at least the the way the sword play was in this movie or depicted in this movie that influence on kill bill i mean you know you know all of the just insane arterial sprays and the gushing and all this stuff and using an umbrella as a as a weapon and (laughs) oh yeah very very cool yeah Uh, i mean yeah one of my favorite parts absolutely uh, (laughs) yeah like the shot that sort of like ends uh sanjuro the uh the kurosawa film uh, I, I thought it was kind of like one of the earliest times for that type of, uh, you know, spraying violence. And it, it, it may well have been, you know, Kurosawa did it again in uh, Ron uh, to, to great effect. But here we see that that same idea uh, played out here in Lady Snowblood. Just like <laughs> every kill is just insane and like over the top and, and kind of uh, the fact that you just see like the blood spraying everywhere all the time, like, it you know you can you can definitely see that um, influence that's on the anime in the middle of uh, Kill Bill, not to mention the fact that you know part of Lady Snowblood is sort of uh, animated or these like kind of like yeah storyboarded animatic uh, moments yeah yeah. <laughs> um, yeah and I think that this story is more or less the story of Oren Ishii right I mean it, it's yeah, Lucy Liu's character mm-hmm. yeah. in a, in a way right um, sure I could see that yeah they they all kind of intertwine a bit 
Um, but I love that the chapters were all named really excellent names. Um, you know, uh-huh, breaking stuff yeah. up by chapter, obviously taken for Kill Bill and Kill Bill 2, you know, um, with these really neat names. The last one, especially uh, chapter four, the pleasure palace, final scene of carnage. And it was like, <laughs> this is what's gonna get ready. <laughs> well, yeah. it's nice with the Tarantino films is like, you have that, it's his sense of humor is kind of over everything and you can kind of, you're kind of in on the joke and you know, not that it's mm-hmm. a joke, but you're in on the sense that there's a little bit of a ha ha. It's like, we know that it's gr- gratuitous for the sake of being gratuitous. And you, you know, you know, all these things, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. whereas with Lady Snowblood, is it that way? I mean, I guess it kind of is, but you don't. I don't know. With Tarantino, like, I don't know. You know, I yeah. know his catalog more, and so you're like, this is his sense of humor. You know, mm-hmm. we know that it's going to be bloody, and we're acknowledging that it's going to be bloody, and we know that it's ridiculous, but we're acknowledging it's going to be ridiculous. And in that being ridiculous, it's awesome. You know. I mean, I think mm-hmm. I can give Lady Snowblood um, a pass on the fantastical elements and the arterial spray and all that, and like the winding story because it is based on a comic right so it, it or a, and a manga right. um and and it's really based on the the history of or the um folklore of the asura the demons you know that are like take mm-hmm. on a human form and take on revenge um so you know in in a way there is kind of that fantasy element to this one that kind of allows it to be um yeah. nuts or crazy you know with, with and, right. and to be okay with it but to, to Omar's point that there's something where it's like it's not letting the audience in on that joke as Agreed. as clearly as uh, Tarantino does. You know, it's it's not you know, sort of winking, uh, winking and nodding the way that Tarantino sort of lets the audience in and like lets them know that like don't take this too seriously, uh, despite the fact that you know some of the subject matter is you know insanely gruesome in Kill Bill. It's done in a way that like it. Um, highlights the irony of it all whereas maybe lady snowblood I, I don't know it's it's not quite as um openly ironic in that way and perhaps that's a uh you know <laughs> a, a, a different culture sensibilities type of thing and and perhaps uh there there are some of those clues there for a japanese audience from the 70s i don't know but um at least uh to uh, our eyes it, it feels like you know it doesn't have that same sort of wink and nod uh to it you know right it's a bit more deadpan yeah. um but i mean maybe that's the aesthetic i don't know maybe i don't get it you know yeah um yeah i i, I totally get what you're saying and they exaggerate a lot of the action obviously the blood is one of those things the fighting and right. everything of course. um the young girl inside of the uh the barrel <laughs> and pi may or whatever his name oh, is right, in this. right push on the side so you don't get thrown out <laughs> when it hits the ground. She's <laughs> cannonballed out of that thing. <laughs> I was like, whoa. <laughs> uh, Man, did you recognize the, uh, the Paime? He was like Dokai, the priest or whatever. Do you recognize him from uh, Bad Sleep Well? Yeah, exactly. Um, I had his name. What, what was Ko, it? Uh, Nishimura. Yep, that's the one. <laughs> I'm glad that we've, we've got like all these like returning people in these great movies. There's like this cool attachment to, to yeah. really great people in these. And you can kind of start seeing this as we're, you know, watching 25 movies a week. <laughs> we start seeing some of those through lines. No, but it, it, it was cool seeing him play a different type of role. Yeah. Like, you know, in, in Bad Sleep Well, he's, you know, jumping at shadows and he's, he's like seeing those ghosts everywhere. And in this one, you know, he's uh, tough as nails and uh, no nonsense uh, martial arts master. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love those training uh, montages and that. Um, obviously that a lot of that was used in volume two, oh, uh-huh. but yeah. um, I, I just, I, I think that those are some of the most fun uh, moments in some of these martial arts films, especially the music in this one. I mean, let's talk, Omar, it's great. Great that you're on the show here. Uh, the music in this one, <laughs> which is interesting because I mean, obviously that, that uh, beginning score, and I think it's the ending score as well in Lady Snowblood. It's also the last score oh, that right. you hear in Kill Bill. Um, the, the subtitles in Lady Snowblood actually give you the, you know, the lyrics of the song. So it was nice to oh, actually right. read yeah. what this song was about. And it kind of gave a little more context to that. Um, and I thought that that for was, sure. I don't know if that was written for this movie. I'm assuming it was, but it was a pretty awesome score. I, I feel score. like I looked it up and I think it was, I mean, the score is also something that it kind of ties into that earlier thing, which is like within the context of Lady Snowblood looking at it through the lens of 2021 20, whatever a mm-hmm. contemporary lens we're like wow it's so kind of hokey schmaltzy but it kind of passes that point where it's like if it if it hadn't passed that one mark 
they'd be like, that's not very good. But it, it greatly exceeds mm-hmm. the line of the delineation between not good and like, actually, I think that's pretty awesome because it's so interesting, you know? And yeah. it becomes super, super cool and stylized. It actually really works. And then when you look at Tarantino and his use of like what we would perceive as being you know, like melodramatic or hokey or whatever, you, however we want to describe it. And but it's obviously this ironic use of it. It like it really works. It becomes like this kind of, I don't know, like a postmodern interpretation of it or something like that. Right. right. And then I was thinking about, but I was thinking about La- Lady Snowblood. I mean, we'll leave the Bride War Black because it's Bernard Herman, and we're not going. I'm not going there. <laughs> Bernard Herman is awesome. But uh, on La- on La- I'm smart enough to know that. I'm not, yeah. not Herman. I may not know much, but I, I'm I may be a moron, but I'm not going to talk about Bernard Herman. Um, on Lady Snowblood, you know, probably when that score was made, they're like, "This is super duper cool." And by the time you get to Tarantino, you're like, "This is not super duper cool, but it's so kind of past the point of of what we perceive as being good that it's actually awesome." And yeah. so I, I kind of like that. Uh, I don't know how I, I really would. That would be a, a fascinating conversation. I don't even know who wrote that that opening title for Lady Snowblood and if they're alive. But it would be a great conversation to have. And if it was just kind of a deadpan, give them this opening title. It's this epic thing. And, you know, it'd be, I'd be really curious right. to like see. It's always fascinating to see how time kind of alters your perception of something. You know, of, yeah. of what was... What what was good and what wasn't good? Was it tasteful? You know, it's it's fascinating to see like how no, for music, sure. obviously film and art in general, how it all ages. And and Lady Snowblood is funny because it's kind of gone to it. I presume it's gone to a place that we never thought it would, at least from the score standpoint. Interesting. Yeah, you know? I mean it it's uh it's a little like it's maybe not quite as extreme, but it's a little like um in Butch Cassidy when they have the the raindrops keep falling on my head, uh mm-hmm. like music video interlude there where it's just like you know maybe in whatever that was 1968 it made sense to like have this uh very contemporary you know interlude in there but you know when you're looking at it now you're like what the hell is that doing there you know it's like in an otherwise you know sort of very uh, straightforward um western we have this like you know <laughs> like you know time piece out of the out of the 60s that Definitely makes it feel uh, a lot more dated than it, it needs to be. Right. Had there not been something contemporary musically in there, it wouldn't have dated the film as much, which is kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. And, and that, that's kind of what this song was, because it was, it was very much uh, of the 70s. It had kind of that slightly schmaltzy uh, you know, vocals to it, and, and that whole thing sort of lent to that idea of like, you know, is this as epic as it can be type of thing? Like, you know, considering... Like, <laughs> The the like the way we just saw the Bernard Herman thing in in uh, Bride War Black, where it's you know you, you have these very strong powerful moments, and then in this one, it has this uh, of its time type of music in it. But you know, like you said, like for for whatever reason in Kill Bill he gets away with using it ironically, uh, but also very powerfully. <laughs> right, it still and, works. Uh, again, yeah. Yeah, and in in Snowblood, like you don't feel that sense of irony, so like it it kind of like oh no, are they are they being too uh, too earnest with with their musical choice here? You know what I was wondering um, is, I mean, it would definitely tie into the Tarantino side of it. Or okay, Morricone, that's what I was thinking of mm-hmm. whenever whenever mm-hmm. I was watching Snowblood, um, and I should have looked up uh, that score, um, the Snowblood score. Which is like how much, I guess I always think about this, like how much does Morricone influence, to an extent, within reason, of course, Mm -hmm. um, all of the scores moving forward from, I don't know, mid-60s, I guess, you know? Yeah, probably 68, And so like I wouldn't shock... When uh, Good Bad Negley came out? It's around there, right? Mm -hmm. And this is 73, right? Snowblood, or 72, 73? Mm -hmm. 73. It makes me wonder like how much of an influence... I'm, so, and I'm a huge Morricone fan. He's like my favorite film uh, composer mm-hmm. by a long shot. Um, and, but it makes me wonder, like, he had, like, such a huge, uh, such a, a very defined style that was uniquely him. And it makes me wonder, because, I mean, I'm not of that era, obviously, but, like, how much 
his influence kind of spread across the world and like was that score actually influenced by him because it kind of mm. seems like it would be it's kind of got this strange not quirky but there's a there's a slight quirk aspect to it maybe it's quirky because right. i'm viewing it through my eyes now not back then but uh, it does the one thing that was kind of just going through my brain, and especially like when you listen to Kill Bill. I don't know, is there if there is any Morricone in Kill Bill? There is, right? There's yeah. stuff that mm-hmm. sounds like it, at least. Yeah. No, for sure there is. I mean, it just seems like Morricone's influence is all over all he, of these. He's credited films. for music. Rizza's credited for music. I right. think there's two people technically for scores. Yeah. I mean, he he's definitely in the the second one. Two. Yeah. Um. But uh, let's see. While Jeremy looks that up, a side note, there is a uh, big collection on the Criterion channel. I guess this has become a commercial for the Criterion yeah. channel. <laughs> um, all Mar- yeah. Morricone's. Our, our sponsor, yeah. <laughs> some of uh, Morricone's best uh, film scores or films with his scores attached. They um, curated all that stuff. So might be oh, really? Worth, yeah, it might be worth checking out. Oh, I'm, I'm going to make a note. Yeah, yeah do that. Uh, yeah, so I, I think... Um, there's a lot more Morricone, I feel like, in the second Kill Bill, but in the in the first one, there's a song from uh, "Death Rides a Horse" mm-hmm. uh, in there, and it became very um, well associated with Kill Bill Volume One because it was like in all the ads or whatever as well. So, uh, but um, right. yeah, I mean, I I think there's uh, it's hard to deny Morricone's impact on film scores, especially of you know, exploitation films or, or you know, like th- these types of movies that were made um, f- for this type of like low budget and, you know, focused on entertainment value. And it's like, it's what? I mean, his stuff is so insane sometimes that like, okay, <laughs> it has the and all this type of, you know, noises in it. But like, you know, that you're like, oh, how does he get away with it? It's like, because all the rest of it is so sort of operatic right. and just pulling so strongly at your heartstrings and you know your emotions and everything else that like he can kind of get away with um you know some of the you know cornier <laughs> moments or, or sort of like ironic sounds that he puts in there and and it's funny i mean because it's like you know that's to also indicate how you're supposed to take some of these spaghetti westerns and whatever that he was becoming famous for um so i think that there's something there where it's like there's this indicator that you're allowed to be having fun with this, but then there's also these like huge emotions that um, almost seem out of place in, in things like, you know, good, the bad and the ugly. Right. I mean, it's like, or, or, you know, any of those spaghetti Westerns, right. Where it's like uh, the music is giving it more um, gravitas than perhaps the, uh, the movie demanded. Sure. Right. But I think that's also stylistically, of the era, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I that's the thing I was wondering. Like, do you, you know you think wah, 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 wah. <laughs> like if you were watching that in what is that sixty eight whatever we said it was? You know, did mm-hmm. you think ha 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 or was it like oh that's so cool? I've never heard anything like that. You know, in a film right. score. Is it a it's far one of these out weird man? Things, like, I don't know. It, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what is that? It's right. like, oh my gosh, this is the, the hippest thing, hippest film score I've ever heard. Because, you know, you're used to, you know, you're coming out of like the golden age of Hollywood. And it's all like big, lush orchestras and stuff like mm-hmm. that. And then you get to that and you're like, bah, 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 bah. what the hell is that? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Was Marconi more into like uh, electronic at the time or like the beginnings of electronic uh, synthesizers and things? I mean, he had sense, but I mean, like he... I, I mean, I think he just did whatever he was called for or whatever they worked had the for the piece. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, but I mean, he's he destroyed it with a with an orchestra. But then he would do these super cool, you know, like the contemporary thing. pieces with drums and guitar. And then you have the thing, of course, that's true. Mm-hmm. But I mean, um, you know, I mean, he would just do band ensemble stuff and just destroy it. And I think he was a, a trumpet player, so that's why he got all the trumpet stuff going on there. I don't know. I mean, he was a beast. He's, yeah, <laughs> he's like there's nothing he couldn't do. I mean, d- just to respect. I have a quick tangent on the thing. I I feel like that score was had to be very influenced by John Carpenter. I mean, it, it sounds so much like 
Carpenter's it, stuff. I, I always thought it was until recently watching the thing and, and knowing who Ennio Marconi was and everything and seeing that he was the one that did the score. I always thought it was Carpenter that did the score for that until no, I, no, not that like Carpenter did it, but but that he was like, you know, helping to dictate what the sound would be to Marconi. Like, okay, here here's what I well, need. Maybe here's Carpenter what I need, was the temp. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean he could he could have just laid it down, right? I mean, that's what I always right, think. Right, right. Yeah. And and that on on that note, I I, I know uh, Omar, you and I have had lots of conversations about temp and how hard that is, uh, or or you know the challenges that presents for a composer. I mean, yeah, exactly. If in the thing, for instance, uh, John Carpenter laid down some stuff that he was thinking, and then got attached to that type of sound, uh, you imagine it would it would be uh, one of those things where Morricone would be having to do a Carpenter sound alike. Type of thing, yeah, because sure. he got because he got boxed into that music that was laid down, right? He can't he can't explore right. that enough because this is what the director wanted. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a common problem. There was something. There was something I was watching. This is a total tangent, but there was something I was watching. Um, it was uh, the loop. What's it called? The thing on Amazon. I'm sorry, this is a horrible description. Uh, it was several months ago. The Tales from the Loop. Tales from the Loop. Thank you. Um, Tales from the Loop, and um, I think I was talking to Kyle, mm-hmm. our Kyle, mm-hmm. um, and he was saying, uh, yeah, listen to the the opening credits to Tales from the Loop. It's obviously, what do you say? It's obviously Max Richter, or it's obviously something, something which I mean, Max Richter's a big contemporary composer. Mm-hmm. And then I looked it up. I was like, who is this? Who's knocking off Max? Uh, they're knocking off the um, the Leftovers. Oh which, yeah, I don't know if it's like you know, kind of a yeah uh, popular opening title, popular mm-hmm. theme, and I looked it up and it's Philip Glass, and I was like, wait, Philip what? Glass, right? What is he doing? <laughs> wait, that doesn't even like it's a weird like chicken or the egg thing because right. I like, always think like usually it'd be the other way around, right? Like yeah, <laughs> yeah, Max Richter, most of his stuff is probably knocking off Philip Glass. With respect, <laughs> yeah. of course, I think I'm a big Max Richter fan, but <laughs> for sure. And then I'm like, wait, it's Philip Glass is the composer had that work, and I wonder if it's the temp. You know, mm-hmm. most likely probably is. Most that's likely. interesting. That's a, it's a common um, issue, I think. So you you've experienced that as well. Oh yeah, I think <laughs> uh, in my, I think it was my first feature. It was like this horrible movie, um, <laughs> and the the final uh, cue, the final scene, really, the run to the curtain was uh, they attempt in um, Morricone's The Ecstasy of Gold. Oh, Do you know God. that one? Yeah, I think you, it's Good, Bad, and Ugly. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, it, it's the climax of Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. And it's like, it's like this super iconic piece of film music. And I remember watching it for the first time, and I heard that temp, and I was like, oh, motherfucker. <laughs> like, what am I going to do with that? <laughs> What am I going to do? I'm talking about setting you up for that. failure, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to beat that. I don't have the budget to even go near that. Right, that too. And I was like, <laughs> it's like there's all these issues. Like I have literally both hands tied behind my back. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I've written something great here, but I don't know if you want to afford the, uh, the you know, 60-piece <laughs> yeah, exactly. orchestra it's going to take to yeah, we can't afford pull this to record fucker it. off. <laughs> and not only that, but to be fair, I'm not going to beat Morricone. Yeah. So come on. <laughs> you know, you're setting me up for failure. Right. So yeah, temp's always an issue. I mean, I think nowadays, like I, I'll listen to the, I'll watch the film once or twice with the temp, and then I just turn it off and I try to forget about it, you know. Or else you chase your tail, you know. Right. Yeah, but I, I it's not so much the temp isn't so much a uh, hindrance. I think for for you specifically, of like, oh, am I going to be able to nail that uh, feeling at, at this moment? It's it's more so for the director of like, well, wait a second, I got used to. Uh, the, right. the Thomas Newman score or that that Hans Zimmer whatever, and now I need you to uh, to <laughs> exactly reproduce that for me. You know? <laughs> right. Well, I think the the real problem is whenever, especially like in a modern world where the film is, if, especially if it's like an action or something quick quickly cut, you know, mm-hmm. where it's cut to that yeah that temp, yeah yeah, and then you're kind of you're married at least to the tempo or like some iteration of that tempo, you know, you've got to somehow keep that continuity of, of, of energy of timing going. I swear. That's why the green Hornet soundtrack ended up in kill bill volume one, that, that motorcycle scene. I don't think that that was planned for that. I think they're just like, throw that in. It's going to be cool. And they just left it. And they left it. Yeah. That's possible. 
It's super duper cool though. Um, yeah, temp, temps. It's a, it's the, it's a common issue. <laughs> I feel like yes, they less, say. less so now. I feel like less. I'm less intimidated by it now because I just turn it off. Mm. You know, so. But it, it doesn't come back to bite you with like notes and whatever. I mean, if you run into there's situations where there's like overt temp love, and that's <laughs> yeah. a hard thing to to deal with, especially. If it's something that's, you know, like an iconic piece um, and, and, you know, you don't want to get too close to the temp because there's, you know, there's copyright issues, obviously. And there's and then there's, you know, artistic <laughs> integrity issues. Sure, as well. sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If we're going to call it like it is. But, oh, that uh, Omar guy. He always rips oh, off man. Morricone. <laughs> <laughs> He's always just right behind Morricone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He would have been great if he if he wasn't just trying to do a Morricone all the right. time. I'd love to hear his oh, own man. stuff. He's just, yeah. a, he's just a wannabe. Um, no, but I mean, you know, you try to every now and then, like I'm I'm on something where they're really into whatever that temp is, and they're like, "Well, can it just have a little bit more of that whatever a cowbell or whatever?" Like, uh-huh. For yeah. example, you know, <laughs> well, it's just a little faster cowbell. It's just got to yeah. be. And you're like, I know where this is going. We're going to that temp. <laughs> And I don't want to go to that temp because there's all sorts of legal issues going with that temp. Right. And I want to write something different. And <laughs> and those those situations suck. But you know, it's part of the part of the business. So no, exactly it comes with the what territory. Comes with the territory. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, and and sometimes you can get away with sort of an eclectic uh, soundtrack. And if you have the you know Tarantino level budgets or whatever, you can right. just uh, you know what. That Green Hornet theme, that sounds cool. So we'll just leave we'll it. We'll buy yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, maybe we should move on to Kill Bill. Um, watching this again was another treat. It's always a treat to watch <laughs> this movie. I, I really I really enjoy this one. This one is definitely one of my tops for him. Um, just, just for the fun factor, I think. I had forgot yeah. actually how much I love that movie. Because <laughs> I hadn't seen it. I probably hadn't seen it in... 10 years or so. Oh, wow. And I'd forgotten how, how awesome that film is. It's really good. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really intense. It's, at least in my mind, it kind of gets overshadowed by... Because that's his fourth film, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. I don't know. For me, for me, like there's other movies I always think about when I think about Tarantino. And I kind of always just kind of like, yeah, Kill Bill. You know? Yeah, yeah. you know? But then I watched it and I was like, oh, man, shit, this is a fantastic movie. I forgot how good this movie is, you know? <laughs> I kind of stuck it with... Um, What's the Grindhouse movie of his? What's Grindhouse? That? Death uh, Proof. Oh, Death Proof. Oh, it's Grindhouse. Yeah. Death Proof. Yeah. I was like, eh, it's kind of like that. I'm like, eh, you know, you know. But it's been a long time <laughs> since I saw it. Kind of in the same vein, right? Like a, a big tribute nostalgia fest. Um, but I think this one is so much better. <laughs> yeah, but it's but it's good. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe I should go watch that movie again, though, because I haven't seen that in a while either. Because that, is that the... Death Proof is pretty good. Wait, Death Proof is after, though, right? Because the Death third Proof film came was after. Jackie Brown. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that came after. Okay. It, it came at the same time when they did that dual release with uh, Rodriguez's um, Robert Rodriguez, zombie yeah. uh, Planet Terror. Planet Terror, yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, this this I, I think this one kind of falls in that same like nostalgia bucket of him trying to show off the movies that he loved once, once upon a time. Um, but again, taking it into his style in a modern time, um, kind of a believable or more of a character that you can relate to because she's just a mother that lost her kid. Um, it almost feels a little bit more grounded than especially Lady Snowblood. Lady Snowblood feels like it's on another planet at some point. Sure. Um, but this what but Kill Bill, you know, feels like this is something that, you know, could happen. So it does kind of take <laughs> the bride wore black that had a little bit more realism, Lady Snowblood with this massive fantastic element, and then kind of finds a good middle ground between the two, even though he's never seen the bride wore black um but yeah supposedly allegedly, <laughs> allegedly <laughs> yeah um but i i do think that this one has it all i, re- I really do i think it's excellent maybe that was just a a lawyer consideration <laughs> like uh he he got a notice from the uh the, the french lawyers and he's like you know what yeah i've never seen it i've never seen it i don't know just i've never deny, even heard of that deny, movie. Deny. Yeah. was that a movie <laughs> bride wore what <laughs> what was that again my yeah <laughs> it's not even close to my movie yeah <laughs> Um, yeah, it, it's funny. Like this, this movie uh, in his uh, sort of uh, au revoir is like, you know, <laughs> okay. So he did uh, Reservoir Dogs, and I think uh, most people ended up seeing that after the sort of white hot stardom of Pulp Fiction. Yeah, 
mm-hmm. the um, sort of slower paced and more character driven story of Jackie Brown didn't uh, sort of connect the same way that the um, just frenetic and, you know, completely nuts and, you know, told out of order story of Pulp Fiction. And so it, it seems like, okay, he wanted to kind of like uh, have another swipe at that apple or whatever uh, with, with this one and kind of doubled down on his, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, campiness and the overt homages, the out of sort of sequence um, storytelling where, you know, we see the, uh, what's her the name? The nonlinear? Green. Vernetta Green's yeah the nonlinear thank you the the nonlinear storytelling with like we see Vernetta Green's uh you know demise first that she ha- right. dies after Oren Ishii yeah, technically in, in in sort of like the chronological timeline she dies after but we see that first mm-hmm. and we end on the Oren Ishii thing uh you know and and then you know we're kind of jumping around time the whole time and in, including the little line from um from Michael Madsen that uh, we were joking about in the beginning <laughs> of this show uh. That is a line out of the out of part two, but we kind of see it at the end of this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That whole ending is basically a preview for the second movie. Um, right, it's a little trailer. Or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, I want to go back to Vernita Green's uh, character. I would have loved to have seen more Vivica Fox in this movie after watching this again. She was oh, man. <laughs> so <laughs> fucking awesome. I forgot how badass she was. She's every every time. <laughs> Should I beep out her name yeah, when yeah. I say it in this uh, one? We'll do that in post. Don't yeah, worry. Exactly. Whenever <laughs> would talk, she'd keep looking at her and be like, shut up, bitch. And she would just like stop and shut up, bitch. <laughs> Very funny, bitch. And she shoots her with the, <laughs> the pop cereal or whatever. The, Man, the that was boom cereal. Boom cereal. <laughs> so ironic. Mean, so funny. I totally forgot about that fight sequence. And then I was watching and I was like, oh, wait, her kid's going to show up. Yeah. And it's like one of those things because it's been, you know, it's like I watched it and I forgot about the film. It's been 10 years and I'm watching it. And I'm like, oh, this is that amazing fight sequence. And wait, the school <laughs> bus is there and they stop and he had that weird, awkward, you know, yes. moment. Yeah. So cool, man. And the daughter walks like exactly in the middle of them, too, for a second out the window as they're holding knives to each other, you know. Right. It, right, right. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah. Again, it was kind of the thing where it's like there's this martial arts movie breaking out in this person's house in Pasadena. You know, like it's a normal right. block and the school bus is pulling up. But inside this house are two people about to kill each other in a knife fight, you know, yeah. like, <laughs> in a martial arts knife. Fight. It's wild. <laughs> and it kind of it kind of brings me back to what we were talking about with Reservoir Dogs, um, specifically with um, Mr. Blonde walking to his car or to his trunk when he was torturing mm-hmm. the cop. And, you know, it kind of has that that wonder that follows him outside. But then you see that there's like this whole world going on outside in LA and in this one garage somewhere randomly in Los Angeles, there's a (laughs) cop being tortured after a jewel thief or a jewel heist goes, you know, it's like, there's more world going on, you know, while there's this like crime happening. I thought, I think that Tarantino is great at, at presenting that for sure. Yeah. But I, 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 that sort of sense of realism, I, I feel like he left behind after uh, Jackie Brown. It's like you know his first three movies. He mm-hmm. he ground the the movies in that that sense of realism. Like you get that same sense of a of a bigger world and like that this is actually happening in our world. I uh, see. In, in Pulp Fiction, when Bruce Willis is sort of you know sneaking back into his own apartment and we're, we're kind of just following him into that. And and in this one, I feel like they just kind of like threw that out the window, right? It's like you know the. We, we, we she can fly. Out her name for no reason and like you know there's just all this like uh kind of like fun and like cartoony stuff that's happening in the movie um the insane insane fight at the end you know it's like <laughs> that just goes on for the pussy know, wagon truck minutes. the pussy wagon the pussy truck wagon, that she yeah, wouldn't exactly. would never choose oh, that truck I'm buck and i like to fuck <laughs> You're Buck, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love that when he's getting slammed by the door and like the second yeah. time he's like, please, please stop hitting me with the door. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she gives him another. <laughs> right, exactly. Oh, but classic. this one, I mean, felt like Lady Snowblood. Um, it, 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 you know, just very a much. Bit. Yeah, just a little bit. Um, well, it felt like a comic book. I mean, that's. Right. That's to, to Jeremy's point. I mean, yeah. I mean, Pulp Fiction. Reservoir Dogs, Jackie Brown, regardless of like how, not ridiculous, but how they still had, were somehow rooted in, mm-hmm. in a little bit of normal life. Yeah, exactly. You know? And then whereas just Kill Bill, it's just straight fantasy. It's a comic book. 
And I mean, that, that goes with Inglorious Bastards, right? That's that's a revisionist look at history. Oh, sure. He completely yeah. changed history for that. Yeah. That's a totally different world, right? Hitler Hitler's dead in that world. <laughs> yeah, and once upon a time right. in Hollywood, I mean... Same, uh, yeah. yeah. They survived. I'm trying to, there's a gap in my mind. What's between Kill Bill and Inglorious? Uh, Death Proof, the Grindhouse one. Mm. That's it? Uh, yeah, I think so. And then it's Inglorious Bastards, and then it's... Uh, D Django, oh, Django, and then it's Django. and then it's Hateful Eight, and then Once Upon a Time. Because he's on number nine now, <laughs> or number. Well, eight? he'll tell you at the front of his movie, uh, whatever, however he counts. Oh, right, movies. that's right. He does. I forgot he does. <laughs> um, speaking of like some shared shots, uh, the Deadly Viper uh, assassination gang yes, low angle God. looking down was in Lady right. Snowblood. It was um, like, oh, the exact same shot. Exact <laughs> same shot. Yeah, they were they had the same look on their face too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then, like, while the bride or is uh, getting into fights at the, the the tea house at the end with uh, is it Gogo or Golgo? What, what was her name? The Gogo, Gogo, go, go. go, go. yeah, like stop. So stop, uh, yeah. while she's fighting uh, Gogo there, Gogo gives her uh, you know a scratch on the arm, and you know she has that same sort of look on her face, yeah. like the, the sort of same pause that they had in Lady Snowblood. We're like, wait a second, someone was able to scratch me. What? <laughs> I'm wounded. <laughs> yeah, this doesn't make sense. I, I'm mortal. Yeah, but Lady Snowblood didn't didn't uh, go for the um, the heroine making it through the end. It was a uh, every everyone seemed to to take to get stabbed at some point or get again get chopped right in half. Um, yeah. Sorry to go back to Lady Snowblood, but I didn't mention mm-hmm. that scene of her name was Ocon- Okono. She was the uh-huh. woman of the um, right, right. the gang that yeah that when, killed her father. Yeah, when when she found her, her her hung. Oh no, it was killed her. It wasn't her father, but it was her right. father's husband. I See don't know. the layers of this movie, man. <laughs> it's confusing. Yeah. <laughs> but when when they found her hanging, you know, she she hanged herself, yeah. and she's just like, no, I'm not gonna. That's not gonna go out like that. She just cut her in half. <laughs> I was yeah. like, holy shit. That was that was right. incredible. That was awesome. Brutal. It seemed like they were gonna <laughs> make her uh you know die at the end of the movie, but uh th- then they just gave her the, like the uh the, the sort of horror movie that the or it's like you know how Halloween where it's like, you know <laughs> wait, where did he go? <laughs> Start the score. Boom, 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 yeah. boom, 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 boom. <laughs> Start the Ennio <laughs> Morricone <laughs> score, right? Um right? uh, but yeah it this one, this one's wild. It's like it's funny because like there's a lot of sort of horrendous uh, tragedy that one has to swallow at the beginning of this to kind of get into like the the having fun part with the movie, uh, which seems like a sort of a hard needle to thread. In Kill Bill. Um, in Kill Bill. Mm. Right. It's like uh, especially if we're talking about like the sort of very opening uh, moment and um, her sort of like. Uh, punishment in the the hospital and everything else and it's it's funny because like the movie like asks a lot of the audience like and, and it's like it's one of those things where i guess there was a a big spate of these sort of uh you know rape revenge stories in the 70s yeah. that he was sort of influenced by there was another uh japanese film hmm. female prisoner 701 scorpion uh thriller a cruel picture you know which is basically the origin story of um daryl hannah's character Oh yeah, that one is sort of uh, you know very cruel for the audience to have to to watch. Um, uh, lots and lots of raping and uh, and revenging afterwards. This one had obviously some of that. It's funny, that, but like they they did space out having to um, absorb so much tragedy and the the sort of like comedy uh, aspects of of the movie. It's like oh, watch out, she's a spitter and all this stuff, right? It's like the, all those little, like little moments. Don't give her that, a shiner. <laughs> kind of. if she's oh, got yeah. any bruises Jesus. on her yeah, this jigs right. up <laughs> right 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 it's terrible exactly. it, it, well I, mean, <laughs> God, I was trying, I to, hate... trying to think of examples of where it was being funny but I guess that's a, it, a it dark was... sense of humor <laughs> but it but it is but it is I guess still funny right I mean you can look sure. at it it's it's terrible and awful don't get me wrong and I would never wish that upon anyone that was those those are some pretty hard scenes but what's great about them is that there's the the revenge payoff right away when the dude from yeah. the Adam Sandler movies gets on top of her and she riffs his fucking <laughs> lip off, I'm like, okay, this is great, you know. And then Butt gets it right away. I don't know. I guess like the only one of the reasons with like a lot of Tarantino that I can watch it and not cringe is because I don't take any of it seriously. 
like I, which sounds like I'm that I'm not being complimentary to Tarantino or I'm not a fan, which I am a huge fan of. Course. I think that's why you don't. <laughs> well, because I, you know what you're getting into, you know? No, I, I, I think that's what he wants you to do. I mean, like for, you know, sometimes like when I first saw this, I, I was taking it too seriously. I think like with, especially like the opening scene of her being shot in the face and like, you know, her waking up and, you know, uh, you know, screaming that uh, child th- her, her child is not there. Right. And then like, you know, uh, going through sort of like the, the uh, you know, obviously in the backstory, she had been, uh, been raped a lot while she was in the hospital, all that stuff. Like I, I was taking probably too seriously. And it sounds like, you know, you guys, uh, Omar, you especially like, we're, we're just like not, not taking it that way, which is probably how he's intending you to do it. Well, I mean, I think, I think it is awful. And at, at the same time, for sure, for you sure. know, I, I, it's, it's, it is hard to watch, but I also like mentally stick myself in like a headspace when I'm watching Tarantino that I'm not going to take it seriously, and that the guts is spaghetti and the blood is just colored water, you know, red water or whatever, mm-hmm, you know. Mm-hmm. I just otherwise it's going to be harder to watch. Like I mean, you'd never be able to get through uh, Reservoir Dogs, you know. It's right. Too much, you know. So that's like my mentally how I adjust myself, so I'm not going to be bothered by it as much as I. Well, I mean, should. He, his. All of his movies have a sense of fun in them. I, I feel like his first three, like we talked about earlier, like it's they were a little more grounded. Like he he totally like unplugged from reality, starting with this movie, with Kill Bill One, sure. and then from then on it was just you know completely on his own planet of like uh, things are just crazy and you know physics don't make sense and you know uh, she gets shot in the head and there's no consequences right and like uh, all, all that stuff. And I, I feel like maybe when I saw it in the theater in 2003, uh, you know, I was still in the sort of uh, Pulp Fiction, Jackie Brown, uh, Reservoir Dogs headspace of like, you know, taking these a little more seriously than, uh, right. than he intended. Well, I mean, that makes sense. Because it was quite a change from Jackie Brown. To go from Jackie yeah, Brown exactly. to this film was like, whoa. Um, but I was really excited to see it, um, especially when it first came out. Yeah, I guess I detached from all that stuff as, as well as, you know, just knowing Tarantino and the, the fun that he is intending behind all of it. You know where he's going to go. Yeah. And it's not going to be pretty. You're right. Yeah. And we're going to all go. <laughs> <you know? laughs> However you get yourself in the headspace to not, you know, cringe is, you know, be able to watch it. That's a good yeah, point. Maybe totally. there's a, maybe there's some sort of meditation people can do before Tarantino films to get, <laughs> get themselves out of taking it too seriously. It It's funny. Cause like, you know, he has this great ability to be really funny in a lot of places. Uh, and, and then there's a lot of places where I just feel like, man, like it's going on way too long. Like the, the scene where we first meet Hattori Hanzu and, you know, she's like ordering sushi and it's just, it's going on forever oh, yeah. and ever. And oh, he's like it. yelling at that guy and he's just like, oh, man. Understand? like, like let's, <laughs> let, let's, uh, let's pick up the pace a little bit here. I, I, you know, for me, I, I'm feeling that, that whole time there, but, uh, you know, perhaps, uh, People who are much more in that Tarantino headspace uh, are enjoying the sort of sitcom-like humor in that more than I am. But I think this movie was was built in like modules, and I think that that module was one of those just like a sitcom type, either Chinese or Japanese sitcom, you know, that's on TV because that's usually how they are. They're like va- very vaudevillian uh, pairs of people uh-huh. in the show, and that's kind <laughs> right. of how those two were, you know, like. Wow, for for twenty years, you know, I get the sake. You 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 make yeah. the sushi. Is like, well, in twenty more years, I'll be the general, and I'll general, still be telling uh, you, I'm the emperor, yeah, <laughs> and I'll still be telling you to get the sake. You know, like, right, right. right. Um, I, I thought that that was fun, and I think that that I know what you mean. It kind of did go on long, but I think that there was intention behind it. You know, it was kind of like another homage within that whole movie of homages. I wonder if it's that, or if I wonder if there was. I mean, he shot a bunch of stuff. It was just gratuitously long scenes. That I wonder mm. if at the beginning he thought we're gonna get cut because they thought it was gonna be one movie, and Jackie Brown was already super. Wasn't Jackie Brown four hours long or something like that? No, that's a short one. It's like, I think it's like one of the shorter ones. Yeah. Really? No, I mean it, it. It was. It was. It was long. It was uh 150 minutes. What? What, what is that? Two and a half uh, hours. Yeah. Two and a half hours. There All you right. go. So it's not, not super short. But I. But that. I didn't even know it was that long. Pace of that. I mean, I, for me, that movie seems like it's long. And I wonder if on Kill Bill, if he shot all this stuff and he thought that they were going to, you know, 
just you know, have to trim the fat in so many places. And at some point, they're like, oh, let's just make two films. And he's like, yes, I can yeah. have this <laughs> gratuitously long yeah. scene, you know, in the in the sushi restaurant. And I don't know. But I did like this to see that, you know, Hattori Hanzo has got this normal life as a sushi restaurant owner. But really, the guy's making instruments of death upstairs in his. Uh, but wait, in- he, he, he's the, 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 the best samurai sword maker in the world. Yeah. <laughs> he has a whole layer upstairs. But wait, there's more. Yeah, exactly. But wait, there's more. He's the he's the 14th one, too, because that's a character that Sonny Chiba played in a, in a show a long time ago in like the 80s. It was like a four season show where he played Hanzo, who was a sword, a blacksmith sword maker. Mm. And apparently he just Tarantino's like, no, you're going to play the same character in this, but you're the 14th in the line of Hanzo's. But it's the same character. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> a Tori Hanzo. <Yeah. laughs> but I don't think Tarantino ever saw that show. You know, he just wanted. No, to no, he, he never saw it. Yeah. <laughs> Allegedly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Should we start wrapping up? Were there some other points? Yeah, one other quick thing is like, you know, speaking about his um, sort of like, you know, very bizarre sense of humor sometimes. It's like, you know, sometimes (laughs) it's it's like it's right on the money and then sometimes it's like, wait, what's going on? Like, there was that moment where it's like, uh, silly rabbit tricks are for kids. It's like that that, that, like exchange and it's like, it was almost out of Demolition Man where it's like they they had like, they're just spouting uh, old uh, commercials or whatever for no Armor hot dogs. (laughs) (laughs) Armor hot dogs. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I, that one kind of uh, gets to me every time. I don't understand. I mean, I think it's kind of a play on her name, the Beatrix, right? Like that's ultimately what it is. But they don't know. You don't know what her name is in the first one, so that joke doesn't uh-huh. land until Kill right. Bill Two. Silly Rabbit, Beatrix are for kids. Uh, Tricks yeah, are for kids. Yeah. yeah okay. um, but then right. the other one that bothers me is this is what you get for fucking around with your <laughs> Go home to your mother. And she starts spanking that that last kid that's going to get beat. Yeah. I'm like. That was ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, it was it's funny, but it didn't really land for me, <laughs> especially because that's the last person that she goes against before she goes into her final battle, right, right. before it turns into Lady Snowblood for real. <laughs> well, it's like, you know, pacing wise, you you maybe wanted the uh, that sort of comic relief moment, I guess. Uh, maybe the, the comedy of the comic relief uh, just wasn't. Uh, Cut that the, guy in half. Right way. Yeah. Cut him in half. Like everyone else. Go is, home to your mother. Wait, psych. Yeah, exactly. Like as he's running away. Yeah. But leave yeah. your limbs, right? Those belong to me. And now, now you show mercy at this point <laughs> yeah. in the film. It, that, that's exact. That's exactly the problem with it. It's exactly it because it's like no, this woman just brute. She went through like a dead alive scene in this in this <laughs> one area, just obliterated this entire place, you know. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, well, she's just going to say said that. She doesn't show the what, what was the line? Uh, it's it's compassion I lack or something like that. To Vernita Green, right? That line. Yeah, of the, yeah. yeah. No, no, it's right. not uh, a strategy or something I lack, but it but it's mercy and something else. That's this like, is <laughs> this is when we put the real line in in post because yeah. we can't figure it. Out. Right. It's mercy, compassion, and forgiveness I lack, not rationality. We nailed that line when we said it out on the show. Yeah, you'll just have to you take just, our word for you it. You got it perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Good job with that line, Jeremy. Yeah, yeah. I'm <laughs> such a perfect total recall for every line in the movie. <laughs> um, and, and, and real quick, just one, one last thing I wanted to say about Lady Snowblood before we uh, take her on home. Um, <laughs> the ending was so interesting because, like, this is something we, we kind of didn't talk about was, like, that just from seeing the sort of poster art and, uh, you know, maybe the trailer for the movie, you would assume that this is sort of like the feudal Japan uh, you know, sort of samurai era and everything else. And, you know, apparently the the author of the manga was was really uh, fascinated with the, uh, I'm not sure how to say this, like the, the Meiji era or something like that. Um, Meiji uh, era, where Japan is sort of westernizing in this way and like becoming uh, sort of like, well, what were the, uh, in the 1880s, what were the, the Western superpowers doing? Uh, they, they were, becoming uh imperial and and uh t- you know taking over all these areas and like okay we're gonna do the same thing and we'll uh we'll, we'll dress with the same like uh uniforms with, like the, the sort of uh all the like medals and shit on your um on your generals uh you know lapels and 
then they get to the very end and like there's sort of this this sort of like uh two worlds uh colliding type of thing where it's you know people still in kimonos and then also other people Mm -hmm. uh in these sort of western uh almost uh kubrickian masquerade ball at the end there and there's something like really interesting about that sort of like worlds colliding there like you you're getting like um certain people were using guns at one point and like you know there's, there's still sort of like gun versus sword play uh which was like a kind of a fun uh like contrast dodging bullets but i I don't know if you've seen the uh the uh um guy Ritchie sherlock holmes movies but like the second one that he did oh yeah like the ending of that that movie was seems like it was very very influenced by uh by lady snowblood just in terms of like Hmm. the sort of mask that was sort of like you know laid onto one of the characters and like the, the the costume ball at the end there Anyway, if uh, <laughs> we could have used uh, Lady Snowblood as a uh, influencing Sherlock Holmes to the Game of Shadows, whatever it was called. Yeah. That's the exact name. Yeah. <laughs> hey, right here. Look at that. See, I, I told you I have total recall for all these things. <laughs> I have a feeling that Lady Snowblood is going to totally make another appearance in another episode. It's going to be wh- how many movies can we find that are influenced by Lady yeah. Snowblood? Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, yeah, exactly. it's limitless. Next 10 episodes all include something with Lady Snowblood. Yeah. <laughs> But we're we're talking about Roger Rabbit. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. No, you heard me. Yeah, yeah. The dip. You know, that's yeah. all. <laughs> right. Exactly. It could happen. Well, Omar, uh, thanks for thanks for joining us, man. Um, anywhere that uh, people can follow you online, or anywhere that you'd want people to follow you. I mean, I'm on uh, I'm on Instagram. I think Omar Fidel Composer, and I'm on uh, the Facebook, and I'm online omarfidel.com. I'm I'm, I'm around. I'm I'm accessible. Anything that you're uh, you're working on right now, or that you can talk about, I should say. Uh, well, I just started a new film, but that's an action thriller that I, I don't think I can talk about. Uh, Critical Role, their new campaign is going to begin, and that's all my music. And then um, there's a little old film that uh, Jeremy and I uh, worked on together that we're waiting to see when that's going to get released, called A Hard Problem, which I'm super proud of, and I assume Jeremy is as well. Absolutely. Um, and uh, when, when are we gonna? When can we expect to get that uh, wide release of that soundtrack? That is a question that I do not know the answer to. There are all <laughs> sorts of licensing issues there that are above my pay grade. Was that I the say. vinyl that you've? I think I saw the vinyl that yeah, was, yeah. Uh, Jeremy posted. Yeah, that looks yeah, amazing. Totally. I I'm super happy with it. That's great. Yeah. So no, it it it's an awesome score, and uh, hopefully one day, thank you, you too will get to be able to hear that at home. Excellent. Um. Yeah, I, I I hope so. I mean, I think that, you know, whenever they figure out, you know, who's putting out the film, somebody will have to deal with the uh, the issue of who's going to pay Radiohead. Yeah. Further <laughs> oh. Because right. it won't be me. So. Yeah. <laughs> just just for, uh, for, for uh, everyone except for Omar and I, um, like w- one of the songs uh, was a uh, – that he um, – did the uh, how do you how do you put it? You did a cover of or you, you did the arrangement of um, one, the of, one of them was a Radiohead song, yeah. Yeah, it was an orchestral arrangement of uh, Paranoid Android, which was yeah. um, the bane of my existence for a little bit of time. And now, <laughs> to be fair, uh, I am a big Radiohead fan. Um, that song is ruined for me. I don't want everyone. Oh. To listen to <laughs> it's just, Same, dude. It's I, too much. Cutting that that end that end sequence. Uh, all I could hear in my head was "God loves his children" over and over and over I know. again. Oh, I would yeah. go to sleep with hearing that over and over again. <laughs> just, and, I, and I was I was doing it with your temp. I wasn't even doing it with like their their song. So. <laughs> no, it's great. It's great. I love that album. I will. You know how there, there's there's always a song on even pick however good yeah, an album yeah. it is and you're like skip that's yeah. gonna be my song on okay computer i just can't do it anymore it's too much right on yeah well if uh for some reason we can't get those uh rights worked out uh you'll have to release the soundtrack uh minus one song at some yeah, point that'd be a shame but i'm sure that that's what i mean i think i don't think it's a big deal um you just do a, a, a limited fit. japanese release with that song on there and then uh everything else uh We'll have the 14 tracks and that one will have 15. Yeah, you know, somebody will put it online anyway. It's, it's, it's just, you know. I, gee, I don't know There's how it got two, out there. <laughs> I, I, it didn't leave my studio. I don't know who did it. Have you talked to Jeremy? Yeah. Cut this think, part. Cut this part. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> nah, man. I'm sure it'll come out at some point. We just got to be patient and see what's, uh, how that whole thing's going to play out. So. 
I'm excited yeah, to absolutely. to hear and see that movie. Yeah, well, and I um, just wrap it up here. I, you know, again, uh, thanks a lot, Omar. I'm glad uh, we finally got you on the show. That was a, it was a lot of fun having you here. Thank you both for having me. I had I had a blast. Awesome. Yeah. We'll have to do this I again love, sometime. I love geek, geeking out on film. I would love that. Absolutely. It was a pleasure. Um, great. Uh, next week, uh, we are getting back into Kill Bill Volume 2. Um, How did and- we do that? <laughs> Inspiring Kill Bill Volume 2 is the name of the next episode. So this is probably the first time we've actually gone in order of inspiring. So this this actually makes <laughs> sense for us. Uh, that, that episode, we were going to focus on three films again. Five Fingers of Death, Hanny Calder, Kill Bill 2. Uh, Five Fingers of Death, I believe I saw a long time ago. But Hanny Calder, I have not. Um, and it, watching some trailers of it, it definitely feels like Kill Bill 2. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think we're in the... Movie. Yeah, it was uh, Raquel, Raquel Welch. Welch and um, Ernest Borgnine, um, Jack Illum. Uh, it's a it's a western. Um, yeah, I mean, I I pretty much same boat. I, I feel like I've seen Five Fingers of Death. I mean, a long time ago, and yeah. it was probably dubbed in English. I'm kind of debating whether to watch it in same. Chinese with subtitles yeah. or <laughs> dubbed in English. You know, the way I probably would have first seen it. Um, but I'm looking forward to Hanny Calder. I haven't seen that before. And thought, you know, it'd be great to get a Western in there. Uh, I feel like, you know, between uh, these sort of four movies, we're going to be able to kind of hit some of the the quadrants of uh, the influences on Kill Bill. Right. Yep. Sounds great. Uh, Thank you for listening. Please make sure to subscribe and follow us on all the podcasts and social platforms at the Grindhouse Institute. And if you really want to give us a boost, check us out on Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and review. It helps us to get noticed. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll be back next week. Ciao. That woman deserves her revenge. And we deserve to die. But then again, so does she. So I guess we'll just see. <laughs>